All right. So uh, once again, welcome. I'm sorry for the delay. Um, so learning continuity planning and learning in the times of disruption. Like I said, some of these things uh, we wish we were thinking of a few months ago, but nonetheless, uh, at least we are having this discussion. And that's an important part of uh, being in L&D, being prepared for difficult and new situations and being able to respond to them. Uh, Two main organizations, uh, Ripples Learning and CHRMP are responsible for this webinar. Ripples Learning is a learning consulting firm. CHRMP is a certification in human resource management, and I'll be sharing details about them in due course, right? So let's get started. Now, um, it's true that in the last few weeks, workplace learning has been hit really hard. And I think it would not be uh, wrong on my part to say that almost all in-person training programs have been canceled uh, in Europe, definitely in Asia, mostly. And now obviously with the 21 day lockdown in India, uh, in the US, some of some critical programs might be continuing because half of the country is still uh, working or on the roads, there is no complete lockdown, but it would be fair to say that a huge number of programs have been indeed canceled. So the first question, um, that we need to ask ourselves is why have learning continuity at all? Why can't we just suspend learning uh, for the time being and say that we don't need it anymore? It's not a critical activity. It's not, uh, it's not something that we need to do uh, all the time. Why not suspend it? And I think the answer to that is something that uh, we already know. And the answer is two, two fold answers actually, right? What is the reason? for learning continuity to go on in our uh, existing business environment. I think the first reason is, so th if there are two columns here, as you can see, one of them is called uh, uh, a functional, the functional column, which has functional reasons. And the other one has sort of more psychological reasons why learning should continue. So you can see that capability will remain critical. Uh, it's not that uh, employees or staff don't need capability now because uh, uh, there is a disruption in the business. Uh, there is uh, also there is a there is a space where people are not operating uh, where they are talking to each other, so the serendipitous uh, nature of learning is also not happening anymore. It's not like people are walking by uh, next to each other and learning from each other. That is sort of suspended in this environment where we have uh, where we have uh, remote learning going on, right? Um, also, unmet ne learning needs will continue to impact business outcomes. Uh, if there is something, if, if there is something that an employee doesn't know and he needs that knowledge, skill or attitude to execute a particular task, he cannot suspend that activity uh, or he cannot magically uh, uh, claim all those skills or uh, knowledge that is required to do that activity that remains uh, a need. In fact, to navigate these unique circumstances which are created because of the disruption, Chances are that employees need a whole new set of skills uh, to deal with and to navigate these uh, these new situations, right? Th these are the functional reasons why capability building, why uh, learning, why skills remain important and why we should continue to build them. Um, but it is also true that learning leads uh, from a psychological perspective, morale is boosted when learning continues. Employees receive a message of confidence and preparedness when learning continues they feel that something is happening. You know, we are developing ourselves. Also in uh, the current disruptive times, a lot of people might be experiencing anxiety or isolation and learning helps with that. And it has a positive ripple effect. So uh, also I think learning has a very unique short-term goal. The other day I was listening to a psychotherapist and she said that when the long-term outcomes and long-term tasks are uncertain, what really gives us psychological relief is if there are some quick short -term outcomes that we can achieve and learning something definitely falls in that category where we can achieve uh, a learning outcome at the end of a learning session. And that also is a sort of a relief for the person undergoing that experience. It's a net positive learning something. There's no pressure of doing a task yet. There is a, a feeling of having achieved or accomplished something which could lead to a positive ripple effect. It also gives, a feeling of business as usual, you know, we are learning, we are growing, which means we expect things to change. We expect things to become better with time, right? So these are the, these are some key reasons why learning should go on, right? Um, now, uh, 
there is a disruption that we are experiencing right now. And there are two ways of responding to this. One is tactical. What do we do right now? We are in this situation where everybody is uh, locked down in their homes. And how do we deal with that? And of course, the other one is uh, to take a more uh, strategic, uh, uh, strategic uh, view of the situation and decide uh, what are we going to do uh, uh, henceforth or what is an overview of this whole thing. So I want to tackle both of them in this webinar. So first of all, let's look at what is the duration of this disruption and that could determine what our response or our uh, reaction is going to be. Is it one to four weeks? Is it four to 12 weeks? Or is it more than uh, 12 weeks, right? So if we are experiencing a shorter duration of disruption, then our uh, response might be different. If our disruption is going to be very long, then again, our response might be different, right? So for example, if your expected disruption is two to four weeks, maybe what you do is you adjust the learning load and put some temporary measures in place, right? You know that in four weeks, things will be back to normal. So this is what we need to do in the meanwhile. Um, maybe we can go with some makeshift measures in place. We don't need to invent a whole new process, a whole new system, a whole new mechanism for it. We will do something to deal with it right now till things go back to normal. Uh, if it is of a longer duration, four to 12 weeks, then maybe we need to use remote technologies intensively. We want to put some process in place because I think three months is too long a duration uh, where, you, where you leave learning unattended and you ignore it completely, right? More than 12 weeks, we really need to redefine how we are approaching learning. What, is, what do we want people to learn? How do we want them to learn it? Why do we want them to learn it? And really rethink and reimagine our learning interventions and then decide on the basis of this new thinking what we uh, hope to do uh, with our learning plan uh, that we learning plan that we have in place, right? Um, so uh, uh, also, what could be some uh, generic scenarios that where disruption could happen? I mean, right now we are faced with one scenario, but what are other scenarios that could happen, right? So it's important to consider that right now. So for example, what could happen? is you suddenly have an unavailability of training facilities, the place where you conduct training, whether it's a lab or it's a classroom or, uh, I mean, training is a very specific, it happens in a very specific way. You need some equipment for it. You might need some equipment for it. You might need a vestibule or some kind of a demonstration area. You might need a room in a particular setting. If that is not available, what do you do? The another generic scenario could be if there's a significant reduction of instructor or staff if that happens, then again, you need some kind of a solution uh, for that. You need to plan for it. And uh, what if people can't be in contact with each other? For example, a pandemic, of course, that's the third thing that we are facing right now, right? So if these are the scenarios for which we need to do learning continuity planning, how would we approach it? What would we do? Uh, let's look at some options. So what would you do? if you have an unavailability of training facilities. So, well, some straightforward answers are, you could evaluate alternative locations, you could consider moving online, you could also consider canceling the program. These are three options that are available when training facilities become unavailable. If there is a loss of instructors, instructors are not available, then you can create backup instructors. Um, so you should have a roster ideally in place. You can merge with another uh, learning session so if some other training is happening, which has similar objectives or where these learning objectives could be uh, added on to those objectives, maybe two programs could be merged and that, could, that is something that could happen, right? Uh, create backup uh, self-paced sessions. So that's a good idea while you have the staff available, while you have the instructors available, why not uh, create um, a backup uh, self-paced sessions, use these guys, record them, uh, use a designer, put some uh, graphics in place so that the instructors and their instruction is available even if the participants are not available. Uh, you can also enroll in an external course with aligned learning outcomes. So if your instructors are not available, are those instructors available somewhere else? Can they be accessed? Those are some options that we can consider, right? Um, and of course, you can also consider uh, canceling the session, right? You can also consider canceling the uh, session. I mean, that is that is an option if the instructors are not available, right? Now, uh, what happens in the case of pandemic, right? 
um, of course, one two options are there. One is to move online, and the other one is to rethink and reimagine programs for virtual instructions. In some cases, moving online could be easier, and in some cases, it could be difficult. In which case, you have to re reimagine and rethink the whole program, right? Um, uh, now, what is a course of action that uh, could be recommended uh, to do learning continuity planning? Imagining that none of this has happened so far, what would be the course of action? So here is what we could do, right? We could create a prioritized list of courses which may be most affected by disruption. So you, again, I will, I, I'll, I'll drop an action plan for you where I'll talk about this in more detail. Uh, create a prioritized list of courses which may be, so you have a list of courses that these are the courses we want to protect. Create a set of responses uh, to the type of disruption that might occur. Then again, what is the kind of disruption? Remember, we spoke about the three kinds of disruption that could occur. The training facility becomes unavailable, the instructor becomes available, or participants cannot be in the same room, right? Create a roster of replacement instructors or additional instructors that uh, if you have that roster in place, then that could be one way of uh, making, uh, uh, making your learning continuity plan. So essentially, your LCP would have these elements present in it, right? Determining alternative locations for training delivery, that would be one part of it. Determine um, acceptable modifications to the course. So for example, what could you modify about the course to change, to continue to deliver it while you deal with all these new problems and realities? For example, could it be the classroom time? Uh, could it be self-learning aids? You know, for example, is there a part of the program that you could just deliver by giving a book or a written material to people and asking them to self-study? Similarly, for self-paced uh, options, you could have video instruction. Uh, if you are planning to conduct some kind of assessment or uh, certification, you could do web proctoring. Uh, you could have alternative grading methods um, available. Uh, you could have virtual classrooms. You could have virtual experiential learning. So these are the what these are the options available from this. What could you choose to uh, deal with the disruption that you are facing? Um, also, it's helpful to have a go to online platform, which means that if you have a, a, a sequence or a, a way in which you deliver all your programs, it's a good idea to have an alternative in place, an online platform, which is also ready to deliver in case this the existing system fails. Right. Um, and also you can add information about it in your invitation mails. For example, if you, you might say that in case this option becomes unavailable, then the other option available is this, and this is where we would be learning. Um, also, if you have a certification program, then you might want to determine any changes in the certification methodology. How will you assess the pro how will you assess individuals? How will you award? Uh, will there be any change in the assessment and awarding of a certification that should be uh, also considered? as a part of your, uh, uh, as a part of your uh, uh, learning continuity plan. So that, that these are the key components that you would find in your learning continuity plan. Uh, developing and implementing communication plan uh, to a part. Uh, so, so, so once you have, once this uh, emergency plan is kicked off, it's in place, uh, it starts running, then you really need to reach out and uh, tell people uh, whether it is your participants, your instructors, your other stakeholders that, you know, th this plan has been activated, our learning continuity plan has been activated. And this is how we are dealing with the new uh, disruption. Uh, this, uh, th this is the new decision making structure. These are the people who are responsible. This is what we are doing, right? Now, this is what an LCP would look like uh, if we had one in place. Now, if we don't have in place, what can we do right now in the given circumstances with the uh, coronavirus crisis and the COVID-19 disease spreading across the world. Uh, many of us have been uh, restricted to our homes, movement is restricted, social distancing is uh, the norm of the day. How, what can we do now, right? So what would be my recommendation that, you know, this is how I think you should deal with the uh, existing reality, right? So what I would recommend is um, the following action plan, right? Uh, so the first thing I think we should do is assemble the important stakeholders uh, who are um, who, who are the people who, who have a stake in this learning happening. Um, why are they interested in it? Why do they care about it? What is the reason that they initiated it? Who are the champions that you have? So uh, gather these people uh, in, a, in a room or maybe not in a room, in a virtual conference room 
uh, take stock of your learning portfolio. Look at what are the programs that you're running. Um, and I think what's important is to do a very, very important triage or sort of a very quick analysis of uh, what is the evaluation criteria on the basis of which you are going to decide which are the most critical and important programs for you. Uh, you have to establish clear decision points and evaluation criteria. So for example, uh, which are the programs that are critical, for example, onboarding programs, uh, critical skills that are being doled out to people who are doing critical roles, maybe this, that is really important and that climbs to the top of your uh, top of your list. Um, also, uh, if, if you have a lot of business units or different regions and they are handling their own learning programs, then you need to empower them to be able to make these decisions, to be able to make these choices, to prioritize their programs. And uh, if they are not able to do that, then and you are centrally, or if you are going to do it centrally, then you need to let them know that this is a decision that is being made uh, from the central uh, uh, central authority. Uh, it has not been decentralized, and then you need to inform them that these are the programs we are keeping. Right? Um, do a quick prioritization of the programs that you're running, and uh, maybe one of these pro plans you can uh, execute. Either cancel the program. You can ask your learning partners if they can transition to an online mode, find alternative learning partners or local instructors, uh, or you can build the solution yourself with your in-house training team. Any of these options you can choose, right? So this is the first uh, part of, that, of what you need to do to deal with the current crisis as a L&D team, as an L&D department. Um, uh, first, gather the stakeholders, uh, have, a dis have clear decision-making and evaluation criteria, uh, create a hierarchy of uh, which programs are most important and why, and then make decisions about the programs as quickly as possible. This has to be done in a, uh, in a, in a sort of a swift manner because obviously we are dealing with an emergency, right? Uh, now, what are the key uh, considerations to evaluate programs? How will you decide which programs um, uh, are uh, on top of your priority as you go ahead and deal with this uh, uh, disruption, right? So the first thing is you need to consider how critical is the topic? What, what is the, uh, how important is that topic that you're, you're teaching and what is the impact of cancellation in the workplace and how soon will it be fed? So for example, if I stop this training program today, how soon will the impact of stopping this program be fed in the workplace? That is a question you need to ask and answer, right? To understand how important a particular program is. You also need to look at what are the number of participants impacted and uh, uh, is the program suitable at all for digital delivery, right? So these are some questions you need to ask to figure out what to do with which program. So again, look at your learning portfolio, uh, get your stakeholders um, buy in, uh, look at the learning programs, decide, do you want to build it yourself? Do you want to redesign it? Is it easily, is it something that moves easily to a digital environment or is it something that requires a lot of effort, right? Um, again, um, uh, if you are going to have at all in-person programs, so I think pretty much right now in India, at least we are in a state of lockdown, but a lot of countries are not in a state of lockdown. So if they are going to have in-person programs in the state of a pandemic, what are some things that they need to do, right? So first of all, we must prioritize safety. We must figure out what kind of social distancing will be put in place while we are running this program. Can we reduce travel? Can we use local resources? For example, if somebody was going to come from outside and deliver the training, can we have remote or local uh, remote video uh, training instruction and local facilitation? So sometimes you can have a mix uh, and match uh, scenario or kind of a blended training where uh, an expert over video uh, gives instruction and then there's a local facilitator who sort of manages the group. How will you practice social distancing within the training room? Um, also, is it possible to remove or reduce ancillary events? For example, usually sometimes we have a kickoff training. Sometimes we have a post training get together. So can we remove or reduce these ancillary events that are there? Uh, what are social norms? For example, you might want to straight away set social norms as the in-person program starts that we will not shake hands. You also might want to rethink some exercises or activities. Sometimes exercises have a component where people physically touch each other or social distancing is compromised, where people are close to each other. So if you have those kind of things happening, you need to rethink about those activities and say that these this is how we will redo these activities while maintaining social distancing. So this is of course, 
in case you have in person programs still happening which will not be the case in many uh, in many of uh, our lives because right now uh, there is a lockdown for the next 21 days so so maybe this is not really relevant for many of us but it is important to consider this because we don't know what the future looks like for example if uh, the covid-19 disease or the coronavirus proves to be a seasonal disease so it comes every year it's something that as winter comes in the virus is back and then we have to deal with it till till the vaccinations kick in or we have herd immunity so uh, till vaccination and herd immunity are there this is something that might become a feature we might have a situation where uh, there is a need for social distancing that uh, comes up again and again it used to happen i mean uh, 100 years ago uh, as there was used to be a flu season where people would stop getting into the pools and they would start practicing social distancing we have not seen it in our lifetime but that doesn't mean it cannot happen again especially with the new virus it could happen so if if uh, such a situation so if this becomes the new normal uh, it is not the new normal right now right now there is a there is sort of a biological war going on with the virus and the rest of humanity and we hope we win and we eradicate the virus but if we don't and this becomes a recurring threat and there is a one wave and then another wave and then a seasonal virus then we need to be prepared to put some of these restrictions in place and rethink some of our social uh, programs or training or programs right so this is of course if you are doing an in person program um what do you do if you are uh, uh not doing an in person program at all you are really exploring the digital way of doing things i think most of us will find ourselves somewhere here right now as we are rethinking our role in the organization and we are rethinking our learning portfolio and we are trying to consider how would we do this if we had to do it online uh so what can we do we can use survey tools we can use virtual meeting rooms we can use virtual classrooms we have self paced learning we have virtual coaching there's file sharing there's co creation tools or collaborative workspaces where people can create something together or work on a document together or make something together and of course we have to worry about training effectiveness measurement how will we measure training effectiveness while we do all of this right so these are uh, the array of things that you can use uh, to deal with the uh, to take your learning online right um now um wh what has been our experience in delivering remote learning cycles something i want to talk about uh, quickly just so that you know uh, what what we have been doing and how it has how it is something that um, how we have been managing this so we have been actually delivering re learning cycles remotely since 2011 and we have been conducting corporate virtual sessions since 2012 a learning needs analysis training effectiveness assessment we moved it completely online in 2014 even for our in person workshops the uh, learning needs analysis and training effectiveness even training effectiveness of l1 and l2 happens with a qr code and it happens online and of course in a physical session you need a qr code in an online session obviously you don't need that you just need a link and that will give you the l1 l2 reports we measure uh, effectiveness at kirkpatrick 1 2 and 3 for our virtual sessions so whichever virtual sessions we conduct we measure um, reaction feedback knowledge feedback and change in behavior after the training right uh, and of course we are constantly upgrading to latest tech stacks um uh, we invented results lab in 2014 which we used to track uh, change in behavior after the training program is over i'll tell talk a little bit more about it but this is just to sort of talk to you about how we do uh, how we do the entire learning cycle remotely even we we do a lot of physical programs but even for them a large part of the workshop a large part of the session actually happens virtually right now uh, so the first step is training needs analysis i'll not talk about design and development because that is i have only one hour and we have other things to talk about but at least some things which are easily transferable online i think we can talk about them right now how do we do needs analysis uh, well it's very straightforward you can surveys you can obviously do it using survey monkey or zoho survey uh, remote focus groups can be uh, done with zoom and zoho uh there is also otter which is a transcription tool which is used for uh, transcribing your zoom meetings you have uh, remote in depth interviews which again zoom zoom home meeting etc will work right so the idea is that uh you move this part 
of the so i mean if you want to triangulate and you want to use if you want to do, uh, if you want to triangulate your training needs analysis so triangulating your training needs analysis simply means that you use three methods to conduct your training needs analysis and not just one because it's going to be more effective that it's research right so research is more effective if you do it um if you if you, if you're getting your uh, if your primary data sources are three uh, compared to two or one uh, and of course you can also look at secondary data but if you're looking at primary data and you look at uh, some of these uh, things so there the, you you can triangulate it by using these three you have survey you have focus group and you have in depth interview triangulation done your needs analysis can be done uh, remotely by using these methods now uh, of course if you are talking about delivery then it is uh, slightly more uh, uh, challenging because uh, really there is something magical about being in the same room together with another person but there are large parts of this which can also be managed and i'll be happy to talk to you about it right so uh, when it comes to virtual delivery about what we do uh, we have been uh, we do a hr certification program i mean the chrmp is a hr certification program which is delivered completely online um, in virtual session as well as self paced session and it is also delivered in person in our uh, uh, training uh, campuses in bangalore and hyderabad and chennai and mumbai um, and gurgaon we also have uh, we also do it in dhaka and we also uh, have partners in other parts of the world like Uh, singapore and california right we also deliver uh, online only virtual sessions for behavioral and leadership topics we have been doing that since 2012 we have worked with a number of companies in doing virtual sessions uh, we have a library of virtual classroom and self paced courses available and of course facilitators are trained in advanced instructional strategies what are some of these advanced instructional strategies i'll just be sharing with you in a minute so we usually run our virtual classrooms uh, classroom sessions with results lab results lab is a tool that we use to measure training effectiveness at level 3 which is kirkpatrick level 3 which is really change in behavior after the program so i'll talk about it in a minute right now uh, if we are talking about delivery and we are talking about the delivery of a virtual session so let me quickly talk about i think this is the hot topic for the day because this is something we are all all be interested in right now about how do we uh, transition our programs uh, to online versions so what we need to do is before the session we need to ensure that the facilitator is comfortable with the technology uh, if uh, participants are uh, 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 joining from different uh, participants are joining from different parts of the uh, world or uh, different geographic areas we need to ensure that they have a local access dial in in addition to any web link some participants might want to dial in from phone rather than uh, using the internet audio we might want to consider a blended program and i would really strongly advocate that so blended program means not just a blanket online session but something before and something after maybe a, a series of workshops maybe some work pre work maybe some uh, program and then some post work because just doing the online classroom might not help you meet the learning outcomes that you have you are trying to meet uh, yeah so like i said send materials in advance while via file sharing and remind participants before you start that this is a material that you have to go through and maybe download it and open it on your desktop as we go through the program uh, keep sessions short obviously we can have full day learning programs um, but it's not uh, advisable to do that for online sessions maybe 90 minutes is ideal 120 minutes is maximum um, well we have done workshops which are longer we have done 3 hours 4 hours and we have been able to manage uh, and retain interest uh, but uh, that might be a slightly more uh, something something difficult to do if you are starting right at the beginning maybe after a few uh, uh, if you are new to it i would suggest 90 to 120 minutes uh, even otherwise it's a best practice it's it's a good idea to do 90 to 120 minutes right now i have a producer that's a very very important part of uh, uh doing this uh, uh doing this uh program uh, which is to have the facilitator and the producer should be different ideally uh who is a producer a producer is somebody who understands all the technical aspects of the platform that the that is being used for example uh if you are using a zoom room or if you are using webex uh, it's good to have somebody who understands 
the technology very well and can has a lot of control over or has a lot of expertise in how to use that technology uh, to ensure that the facilitator's objectives are met. The facilitator, on the other hand, is a subject matter expert. They may or may not be the producer, but ideally it's good if the producer is somebody else and the facilitator and the producer conduct the session together. That is at least what we do and it's a best practice. I would also recommend that you do that. Uh, it's important to design for the number of participants attending the program and also design for your platform and functionality, right? So for example, um, with Zoom, right now we are using Zoom. So a good, good thing to ask would be that, for example, a breakout room, a breakout room is usually available in Zoom meeting, but that is different from Zoom uh, a webinar where, I, where breakout rooms are not available, right? So uh, you have to think about which platform you're using, what it can do. And usually these platforms will have a different versions. They will have a meeting version which is different from a training version, which is different from a webinar version. So you have to understand which version you're using and what can that version do and what can't it do so that you are able to design around that. So that becomes an additional limitation around which you have to design. But of course you do that when you're training in a physical space as well. You think about the structure of the room, whether you have any open area available close by, whether you can break your group into two parts and can one part go to another group. So we anyways design for the environment here. The environment is online. So we have to understand the platform and design for that. Um, yeah, if you're going to have many speakers in a training program, then it's a good idea to have a moderator who keeps bringing the focus back to the participants and then uh, taking it to one speaker and then to another. So sort of somebody who manages the whole thing uh, conceptually and uh, in terms of learning uh, as well. Right. So those are some things we need to keep in mind. Now, this is before the session. Now, if you are conducting the session, uh, virtual session, uh, virtual sessions uh, you are conducting and you want to keep it engaging and interactive. So there are a few things you can do. And uh, one of them is uh, video. So video is very important because there is really no uh, alternative to the nonverbal cues that we get when we look at each other's faces, when we see facial expressions, when we look at eye contact, there's really no alternative to that. So it is extremely important to have a video uh, available. And I would always recommend that you keep the video of the, uh, of the facilitator as well as the participants on. Uh, if you have uh, you have a facility for virtual backgrounds. So for example, right now I'm using a virtual background. It's just a blue screen with the logos on top, which we have designed uh, internally that can be used. If you feel that you don't want to show the background or if the participants feel uh, that they don't want to show the background because they are at home or because they, um, they, 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 they are not comfortable with it. It's an, they feel it's an invasion of their privacy. You can use a virtual background like the one I'm using right now, but video itself is very, very important. The facilitators video should always be on. And I would strongly recommend that the participants videos also as much as possible should be on. Right. And you should maybe inform them beforehand that you're going to ask for this. It ensures that you get information about uh, what they are feeling, what they are thinking, what, whether they are present, Tools like Zoom also have a facility where you can see if somebody closes the window and moves to another window, you can get information that this person is not engaged in the session right now and uh, they have moved to another window and that you can bring them back in by uh, talking about that in a little bit more detail. So that video is very, very critical. Uh, then you have breakout rooms, uh, also very, very important breakout rooms uh, uh, because uh, uh, so what are breakout rooms actually? So breakout rooms are nothing but you have, let us say right now, if there are about, um, uh, let us say 20 people attending your online uh, workshop or your virtual program, you want to make four groups of five people each and you want to give them some activity for 20 minutes and then you want to see how they have done that activity, which is typically what happens in a training room as well. Um, you can do that. You can take your 20 participants, you can create four small rooms within the virtual session give some activities uh, to give the activity to each group, uh, let them do that activity for 10 minutes. Then you bring everybody back into the main room and then they can share what they have done by a simple screen share or by 
showing what the, what they have done uh, by but I think screen share is very easy. Um, it, it also helps we have seen to keep another channel of uh, interaction open. So for example, if you're using Zoom, maybe if you, your organization uses something else, they use Skype chat or they use uh, uh, Microsoft chat or something, then they can just keep that uh, group also online there so that in case somebody gets disconnected or if somebody is having some other trouble, they can mention it. Do you have another channel open where you can talk, not just uh, the platform that you're using. Uh, you can have polls, which are simple opinion polls. You can run a poll to see which what people are doing. This is, we do this all the time and we ask in classrooms, guys, or how many of you have familiar with this idea? Raise your hand. How many of you do this when you have to, uh, uh, so you can gather those results. And if you want, you can also share those results with your participants. It makes training and engaging and interactive. Whiteboards are very interesting. They are the replacement for flip charts. So you can write on a whiteboard. You can even invite your participants to write on the whiteboard. So in that sense, they are slightly better than the flip charts you use in a physical training room because here the whiteboard is there in every in front of everybody and they can all see it and even they can write on it and you can write on it. So it's really, really good, right? You can play some media inside the training room. And of course, the facilitators have to be trained uh, to use the different features that are available, right? Uh, so I just thought I'll make a quick slide to show you how things transition between a classroom and a virtual classroom. So what is a flip chart in a classroom becomes a whiteboard in a virtual classroom. Uh, what is a group activity in a classroom becomes a breakout room in a virtual classroom. What is a simple presentation uh, becomes a virtual classroom. It becomes a screen share or you can even load a PPT. So some soft, some uh, softwares you allow you to load a particular file and then show the file. Um, and others like this one, the one we are using right now, you can just screen share and show the file that you're showing. Um, demonstration of a tool uh, is something you can do in a classroom. In a virtual classroom, you can have a video. Uh, in classroom, you can do polling by raising hands. In a virtual classroom, you can do an online poll. In a classroom, you can ask people to raise hands for clarification. In virtual classrooms, usually there is a raise hand button, which means participants can click that button and you can see that this person has raised their hand and uh, you can now answer a question that they have. In classroom, you have in-person non-verbal cues. You can look at people, you can see what their face looks like. You can see whether they look interested or disinterested. In a virtual classroom, you can have the video on uh, for everybody and then you can see what they, are, what they look like while, they, while you're talking to them and you can get the non-verbal cues. The only thing that is there in a classroom, which is, I mean, of course it is diminished, uh, seeing somebody on video is not the same as seeing them in person, but at least you have some visual uh, cues. Uh, in a classroom, contextual and environmental cues are there. In a virtual classroom, that is missing, right? Which means who is sitting next to whom, wh where, who, who, who is uh, the, all this in the banter that goes on between sessions, a lot of, uh, 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 a lot of uh, unofficial so social informal energy, and interactions that happen in a classroom, those are difficult to have. Not impossible, but difficult to recreate in a virtual classroom. Right? Uh, after the session is over, after your virtual session is over, what should you do? You should share any tools, templates, or job aids, because if they have to use something, uh, they have learned something, they should be able to use it. So for that, they should have tools. Um, you should ask for feedback not just on content, not just on delivery, but also on technology. And you should solve any problems that might have happened and ensure you have a CAPA in place, a corrective action, preventive action in place so that those problems don't happen again. So for example, right now, today, we are not able to stream to Facebook uh, live. So there is some technical problem. So we need to solve it and we need to ensure it doesn't happen again. So that's an example. Okay. Uh, so what is, a typical training flow for one of our sessions. Uh, well, uh, participants do the pre-work and take a pre-assessment. They attend the online virtual session in a meeting like room like this. They take a post assessment and then they give feedback. They use results lab to share how they have applied the ideas that they learned in the workshop, which means you're called Patrick level three change in behavior. You're measuring that and then a training effectiveness report which uh, contains uh, data points on participation and training impact. So this is the flow of a typical virtual training program conducted by us, right? 
Um, this is a sample response of how somebody applied an idea after attending a training program. As you can see, we got it on 2015. And maybe this was a session on conducting, giving feedback. So we asked, were you able to plan before giving a negative feedback? And this person has said uh, in, in our tool results lab, they have spoken about uh, how they faced this particular situation, what tasks they faced, what action they took, and what was the result. So just to give you an answer, just to give you an example of how we track L3, right? Now, uh, this is a library of our virtual workshops that we run. So we have leading teams virtually. We have leadership during difficult times, very appropriate right now. Personal effectiveness while working from home, effectively communicating online, productivity for virtual teams, effective virtual meetings, a very good program, influence and persuasion in an online environment. Now, if your salespeople and your client managers are dealing with clients online, they still have to continue to persuade and influence them. Difficult conversations in a virtual environment, feedback and coaching online, effective virtual communication, email communication. These are some tools. We have attitude, we have dealing with anxiety, managing emotions, uh, we have building rapport skills, virtual negotiation, influence and persuasion, and then cognitive skills. We have design thinking, creative thinking, HR analytics, and then we have virtual facilitation and online coaching. So these are some sessions that we have. We also have pre-recorded sessions. This is a part of, uh, as, as a part of our HR certification program called Certified Human Resource Management Professional, which we um, uh, issue in a partnership with Pearson View. Uh, which is a worldwide leading testing agency uh, with uh, presence in 190 countries. So in 190 countries, you can take our, um, uh, take the CHRMP certification exam. Uh, so these are all 4K quality videos recorded last year in session quizzes, review material, templates. And uh, you and of course, with, with, with this uh, recorded sessions, you can also have a flipped classroom model. So you can see a self-paced course which is basically you go and see a video, uh, a normal video course, uh, a, a, a self-paced course, and then you come for the workshop or a virtual classroom program. So you have, the classroom is flipped because usually in the classroom, what happens is you teach in the classroom and then the homework is what you do at home. But in a flipped classroom, you watch the video at home and then you come to the workshop where you discuss, where you actually do the practice exercises or clarification of doubts and uh, actions. Of course, now in our current situation, everything is at home. The self-paced learning is also at home and the virtual classroom is also at home. Uh, in this version of the program, yeah, so I think I just explained that, what, what, what the flow is, right? Uh, so I'm just trying to finish on time. Uh, so in, the, in our self-paced learning library, we have all these courses for HR professionals uh, on L&D, compensation planning, employee engagement, this is all a certification course uh, for uh, advanced course for, uh, for senior professionals, foundation course for beginners. We have behavioral event interviewing, ownership and responsibility, DNI for managers and ownership and responsibility for employees. These are all pre-recorded sessions. Virtual programs is what we looked at earlier, right? This is what the, uh, the screenshot of the virtual self-paced programs look like, right? Uh, now, how do we measure effectiveness? So I think we are the only organization that measures effectiveness at Kirkpatrick level one, two, three for every virtual training program that we conduct, which means we also measure change in effectiveness. We also measure a change in behavior as a part of our effectiveness. So uh, how do we do this? We do this through a simple survey tool uh, for L1 and L2. So this is L2, L1 we are not showing you because it's very straightforward. There's not much to learn about it. Most of you are from HR, so you must be knowing about it. Uh, level two, this is the, the pink line is really the score people, uh, P1, P2, P3, P4, here are the participants. And on the, on the X axis, um, on, the, on, the, on the Y axis, you see the self-assessment scores. And uh, the pink are the scores they give themselves before the training and the blue line is the score they give themselves after the training. So as you can see, the distance between it shows, it is for everybody except for P7, uh, I think participant seven who showed, uh, who feels that they, uh, they, they, their learning has become less after the training. But that could always be because some a complete rethinking on a particular topic leads to a state of um, openness uh, to learning and confusion where such scores can happen. But broadly, the graph illustrates that people have uh, felt that their assessment scores on this particular training uh, went up after the training. Uh, similarly, for criteria wise, so if you look at the competencies, if there are 14 competencies that you're trying to build in the program, 
then the pink line really indicates the score you gave to your competency before the training and the blue line indicates the comp score you gave yourself after the training. And uh, this is of course, this comes from results lab where you are able to see that uh, you have 90, 84% people after attending the training, they gave responses uh, and 96% uh, had positive responses, which means they took the idea, they applied the idea and 96% had positive responses. And uh, you can also track competency. So for example, if you're doing a program on goal setting and you want people to do to-do lists, then you can see that 29% people participated in that 29% people did that. This is from results lab, right? So 29% did this exercise and 81% had a positive experience. Um, this is a participant report card, which shows you that these are the competencies you're trying to build this list that of competencies that you see here and how many people applied those competencies. I'm sorry, not how many people. So this gentleman here, Ravindra Dash, which competencies did he apply? So after attending the training program, what did this person do after attending the training program? They did, um, these 12 things, 12 actions they took after the program and each action, uh, 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 led to a positive or a negative outcome. You can see that here, the blue line indicates a positive outcome. The red indicates negative. So you can see here that they applied 71% of the ideas that they were taught in the training room and 8.5% of they had 8.5% negative experience and the rest was positive. So you can see that this idea, the second idea, second competency, when they were trying to apply it, they had a 50, 50% outcome which means they succeeded once and they failed once and the others, of course, uh, they have succeeded, but in the third to last, again, they have failed completely in applying that idea. So maybe that gives us an indication that some kind of coaching is needed. Some kind of input is needed to help them improve in that particular area. Right. Uh, <clears throat> so besides the three levels of Kirkpatrick that you can measure, which is reaction, which you can easily measure uh, L2, which is change in behavior. Again, you can easily measure it. Uh, you can do it online you, you don't need offline for it. In fact, personally, I feel online is preferable. Offline is a chore. Uh, and L3, which you can measure through results lab, which is our tool. Uh, I see some Q and A, so I will just look at it at the end of the session. I'll answer all your questions. Don't worry. Uh, I'll stay as long as you want, but um, let me just quickly go through these slides and finish what, 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 what I'm discussing right now. So we have uh, three levels of Kirkpatrick, which you can measure, but you can also look for data points like, attendance, course completion, participation, time spent in session, all this is possible online uh, to get a much more detailed analysis of this than you would otherwise. Um, yeah, and of course, Results Lab, I've spoken enough about it. We invented it in 2014. We have worked with dozens of clients. More, We have more than 12,000 responses. We have worked with 22 organizations to help track change in behavior, so on and so forth. <clears throat> It is already online. It's a SaaS. It runs on laptops. We also provide L1 and L2. You know that. Yeah. So I mean, this is a little bit about us. We founded in 2007. We have uh, more than 200 organizational clients. We do OD consulting. We have certification programs. 20,000 people have gone through our programs, etc. Right. Uh, these are some of our clients um, in different sectors. We have technology, financial services, manufacturing and many others, right? So we have worked with all kinds of companies. This is what we have done. Uh, if you are interested in working with us for your virtual programs, you can always get in touch with us. You can write to veronica.maria at learning.com or you can call her at this number and we'll be happy to work with you. Uh, like I said, I showed you that whole library of programs that we had and uh, we will of course be able to assist you with your virtual training requirements. So with that, I will now take your questions or any, you can go to the chat box and mention uh, any, anything you want to say, or you can ask a question. So the first question is, hi, hi, Joseph, which tool can be used to measure? That's a good question. So it depends upon what you're trying to measure. Like I said, in the context of training, either we are trying to do assessments or we are trying to measure effectiveness, or we are trying to do training needs analysis. So for training needs analysis, we can use any survey tool uh, for the online surveys for questionnaires. We can use uh, Zoom or Skype or any of the virtual meeting tools for in-depth interview and similarly for focus groups as well. 
if you're doing assessments, you can use a tool like Metal, I guess. Uh, if you are doing, um, um, uh, if you are measuring training effectiveness, you can again use survey tools. If you want to do training effectiveness through focus groups and in-depth interview, you can also do that. Or of course, you can use our tool, which is Results Lab, right? Um, yes, now I'm looking for more questions. Yeah. Uh, hi, Vincent. Hi, how are you? Um, yeah, Joseph is asking one more question. You were mentioning measuring the competencies after implementing. Yes, that's right. So, uh, yes, so first at the level of design, you have to be sure of what are the competencies you are building through your program, right? Uh, so th this is at the design level when you're ID, right? Analysis, design, development, implementation, and evaluation. So when you are doing design, what are the competencies you are building? If you know what those competencies are, then you can find a way to measure them. Now we want to measure them where? One is of course L1, which is reaction. So we can leave that because that is really about the content, the delivery, and the environment. The next thing is L2, which is change in knowledge. So for those competencies, are there competencies where knowledge component is really important? How will you measure knowledge? You can do L, you can do a pre and post, or you can do just a post. Pre and post is basically when you say, here is a pre exam, and then there is a post exam, and then change in score means, which is what we do, which shows effectiveness of training. Or you can do L3, which is change in behavior. Uh, change in behavior is. Um, Change in behavior is um, change in behavior is when uh, we want to see what did people do after attending the program, right? So uh, that is something that a tool like Results Lab can help. Uh, so Joseph Anthony says, "Sorry, I have an idea as I used Loominger in my previous company. I need to know more about tools you showed in your presentation." Yes, sure. So actually, most of the tools I showed are publicly available, but Kirkpatrick Level Three, which is change in behavior, is the tool where you use Results Lab where you can get in touch with Veronica, her email is mentioned here, and we'll be happy to organize a demo for you and show you how the tool works, right? Uh, Vincent says, how can we get access to Results Lab? Again, you can get in touch with Veronica and uh, Veronica will uh, organize a demo and she'll take you through the tool and then we'll be happy to talk to you about how you can use the tool. It's a beautiful tool. We've worked with many companies and it's really, I have not really seen any other tool which does this, which helps you measure training effectiveness. And if you, of course, combine it with our virtual workshops, then it's even more effective. But even otherwise, if you're doing your programs internally, you can use results lab. It's totally, uh, you can use it as an admin and you can use it to track your effectiveness. You can also use our trainers to deliver those programs. Uh, Sonu says, uh, post training assessment should be shared with line uh, managers. Oh, Yes, uh, assessment is for going to be used for what purpose? Um, when you say uh, post training assessment, uh, see, I personally and we at triples personally firmly believe that training and assessment should not be mixed. Uh, so when I say assessment, I mean it in the sense of uh, appraisal or evaluation of people that companies do. Training is a developmental activity. So people should be allowed to make mistakes. People should be allowed to uh, mess up because that's learning involves making mistakes. Learning involves failing. So if we make it very tough and we make them hugely accountable for what they learn, that might create an aversion to training in your organization. So that's a cultural impact that might be there. So we don't recommend it. Uh, we like to use positive strokes to motivate people to ensure that they feel that it's something good that is happening. Learning is something good that is happening. Um, so that is number one. But however, yes, of course, you can share uh, the results of post training assessment with your managers. Uh, in fact, uh, in results lab, even the managers can have a login and they can log in and see what the participants are doing after attending the program. So they attended the program. How are they applying the learning? Where are they using it is an exam is something that the managers can see. In fact, they can also like comment share. All of that they can do what you can do in social media these days, right? Uh, Royan D'Souza says, is it possible to measure L4 or any tool for it? L4, unfortunately, uh, it's, I mean, of course, it is possible to measure L4. And in Results Lab, very often you do get L4 type of data, but we don't classify it as L4 because I believe L4 requires a really tight integration between the training department and the business. Uh, the training should really get into the 
into the heart of business to understand what kind of results the business is expecting or desi desiring and then uh, understand the knowledge skill attitude component of that part and then take responsibility for it you can't take responsibility for all l4 results for example customer satisfaction as a trainer you also as a training department you might feel yeah, yeah we will improve customer satisfaction scores but what if that customer satisfaction score is falling because of a poor product or a new product introduction or a change in technology and you take responsibility for that number so you'll get into trouble so it's important to see that component of the customer uh, satisfaction which is because of knowledge skills and attitude of your uh, customer service representatives because technically that is the only part that we can really take responsibility for so uh, uh, that i hope that answers your question uh, roydon um, yeah A any other questions i'll be happy to yeah uh, roydon has raised his hand again yes roydon tell me you can chat or you can use the q and a both are uh, fine okay he says thanks for dancing all right great so any other questions anything else you would like to ask um all right so if there are no more questions we will end for the day thank you so much everyone for coming here and uh, okay i do see some new questions um no actually it's just a thank you okay uh, all right so thank you for attending the webinar i hope you found it useful all the best uh, for the transition that we are all making to a virtual learning environment and uh, uh, i please be in touch uh, veronica's information is here my information is similar is just abhishek.kumar at ripleslearning.com so you can reach out to me as well nice having all of you here have a nice day keep safe don't go out and uh, maintain social distancing uh, bye bye take care see you